Hey guys, my name is Josh, and today we are going to start our journey into a couple of courses that I hope to make on physics, theoretical physics, and topics like that. Now, the way that this is this, that this is going to work is that it's going to be split up into many different fields. We're going to have physics, which is going to be like thermodynamics, mechanics, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, electromagnetism, all the, the, theoretical physics fields. And we're also going to have other subjects in engineering, like aerodynamics, <laughs> deformable bodies, um, all that stuff. Okay. And we're going to have separate courses for each of these. But we're going to start here. We're going to start from the foundations of physics. It's going to be classical mechanics. Basically what this is, is nothing more than Newton. Newton's laws. Newton's theory. Okay. So that's what we're going to start with. That's going to build our foundation. Newtonian mechanics, classical mechanics is around first year undergrad and in a typical university so only background is basic calculus some common sense you know but that's about it so we're gonna focus on Newtonian mechanics in this course and the way I'm gonna teach it is gonna be a little bit unconventional I'm gonna bring in much more complex topics even though it might not be necessary now but later when we learn things like quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics it's going to pay off in the end because I feel like a lot of the times you learn very primitive theory in these um, easier courses and then you just jump to like some crazy things like partition functions, all that crazy stuff. And there's, there's like a big learning gap, learning curve, you know. So I'm just I'm going to try to minimize that curve as much as I can. <laughs> but anyways, let's, let's get right into it. So Newtonian mechanics, this is the theory of the motion of planets, the motion of particles in the classical sense. We're not going too small in that we're not looking at the motion of subatomic particles because that's what quantum mechanics is for, but rather macroscopic objects like a bag of chips or the flow through a pipe. It can all be, um, it can all be written in terms of Newtonian mechanics and Newton's laws. So just to lay the groundwork, um, we're going to have, in, in the classical mechanics, we have a Cartesian coordinate system, so x, y, and z. And then, of course, we have a right-hand rule, so x is here, y is here. And you can imagine that if you put your hand in the direction of x and curl your fingers towards the direction of y, your thumb is actually going to point in the z direction. This is called the right-hand rule. And this is what scientists adopt. This is what engineers adopt as their standard frame of reference. If you're using the left-hand rule, Z would be pointing downward. You can try it yourself. You'll see. But in this right-hand rule, let's say we have a point here. So our position, our position vector, would be from our origin of our frame and to the point. Let's call it P. And we denote this as X. And X is, of course, a vector. <laughs> So x is our position formally, and as I said, it's the distance from the origin, and it's going to be a vector. It's going to have an x component, a y component, and a z component. And you can already see it's a little bit confusing that we write the position as x, but also the x coordinate as x. So a lot of the time, a lot of the times, I'm just going to write the position as r, because that that just clarifies it a bit better. If we take the derivative of the position, we get the velocity. So the velocity, in the classical sense, is defined to be every time I put a three, uh, three horizontal lines, that means defined to be. You could also write something like this, with two, with an equal sign and a triangle on top, but that's a little too formal for me. I just like doing that. Okay, v, the velocity is defined to be the uh, derivative of the position. And I hope you guys all know what derivatives are at this point. And this it just means that it's the rate of change of position. If my position is changing 5 meters every second, my velocity is 5 meters per second. Okay. And lastly, our acceleration is defined as the derivative of the velocity. And alternate definition is just the second derivative of position. 
okay? And, okay, and there's also other things like jerk, which is the derivative of acceleration, and the derivative of jerk, la, 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 la. We, we don't really need to worry about those right now. But let's say we're in our space again, and I have some motion in our space, something like that, let's say. So this would be characterized as a traje trajectory, right, through our space. We start at this point, and each intermediate point, we go into a new position, and eventually we stop at some end point. So the trajectory is just your position, but now your position is going to be parameterized by something. And usually, in classical mechanics, it's parameterized by time. In relativity, we'll see that you can parameterize the position using another thing called proper time. But this, this we'll talk about this later. Okay, but this is just the foundation of everything. So your position is parameterized by some kind of variable, time. Okay, just as in polar coordinates, your uh, a position position is parameterized by a radial distance and an angle. Here, our position is parameterized by time. All right, so let me scroll down a bit, get a nice color for you guys. Let's see, maybe something red. Yeah. Okay, so we have our position. We our position is parameterized by time, so we can, if we know our position, velocity, acceleration, we know the trajectory of our orbit. We know the, we know basically everything about it in the classical sense. But now let's say I have a box and I want to push the box. How far is the box gonna go? Or let's say I have a planet, and I want to study the motion of the planet. What governs the dynamics of a planet, right? And what governs that is Newton's laws. All right, so Newton's laws. And I don't want to belabor you with this. I can talk about how Newton discovered these laws. I don't know, I could make some stuff up for you. And then I could say how he wrote it in his paper, The Principia. But let's just talk about these laws, shall we? First law, Newton's first law, an object in motion will remain in motion, an object at rest will remain at rest. A very famous law. And that just means that if there's no external force, if f is zero, then the velocity will remain constant. Okay? And if there's no velocity to begin with, then it's just going to stay still. Object at rest will stay at rest. Newton's second law. Newton's second law describes the relationship between forces, forces acting on a system, and its acceleration, the acceleration of the system. And what it says specifically is that the sum of all the forces, okay, the net force of our system, the vector sum, is going to be equal to the mass of the system times its acceleration. Or more formally, it's going to be m times d squared r by dt squared. Here I've used the other definition of r. Okay, that's Newton's second law. And we're going to have a lot of practice working with this law specifically. Newton's third law, every action has an equal, equal sorry, an opposite reaction, which means that if I have some force F on, an, on the ith mass by the jth mass, okay, this means the force on the ith, ith mass due to the jth mass, is going to be equal and opposite to, so there's a negative in there, the force on the jth mass due to the ith mass. Put very simply. And this is going to apply everywhere. It's going to apply to the two-body problem, the n-body plot problem. It's going to apply when we have something like a, let me choose a different color here, it's not like if we have a, a table or something, and we have a box on the table, box has some kind of mass m obviously it's going to exhort a force of mg that's its gravitational weight but then there's also going to be a force upward which is the normal force and it's going to be equal and opposite so n is going to be negative mg right that's newton's third law at work right there okay so now with our uh, little discussion on newton's laws i want to digress a little bit into the subject of frames 
Now frames are really important. Whenever you want to solve a problem, let's say it's a dynamics problem, you always want to pick a suitable frame to perform your calculations in. And the thing about physics is that essentially it should be invariant no matter which way you look at it. So let's say I can look at it from space and you can look at it from the earth standing still. This the same physics, the same laws of physics should be invariant under that. And that that has a special name to it. It's actually called the principle of relativity. Okay? And that's something really important that we're going to get back to much later. But this this principle itself is really important in that it basically says that physics shouldn't be relative. You and me should be able to see the same physics and see the same phenomenon happening. That's basically the, the theory behind it. Now, there is a special type of frame. It's called an inertial frame. And in an inertial frame, actually, let me write this down real quick. I'm just going to scroll down a bit. Okay. So, let's pick a nice color here. So, inertial frames are especially important. Inertial frames. Now, what inertial, an inertial frame is, is a frame that's either not moving, it's stationary, it's fixed in space and time, or it's moving with a constant velocity. Okay? You can still do that. But the main thing is that acceleration has to be zero. Okay? Acceleration has to be zero for it to be an inertial frame. Now, the reason why inertial frames are so important is that we, Newton's first law, an object at rest will stay at rest and, and an object in motion will stay in motion. We have to define this inertial frame to be what one in which travel is indeed at constant velocity. Okay? So that's the whole context. We need to use inertial frames when we're working with um, Newtonian mechanics. Or else we have to do something different if we're in like an accelerating frame, for example, which we can be sometimes. But basically, Newton's first law means that inertial frames do exist. All right. And now I'm going to go to a little more advanced topic. It's called Galilean relativity. But it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to prove itself here. So what Galilean relativity is and what this uh, whole concept is, is basically saying that inertial frames are, oops, did not want to do that. So this is basically saying that inertial frames are not unique. Now, unique, what does that mean? Hmm. That means that I can make a transformation if I'd like, and it'll give me the same exact physics. Let's say I have some inertial frame S, okay? And S could be a standard XYZ coordinate system over there, like on the equator. I can construct another frame, S prime, same, it's another inertial frame, but it's going to be completely equivalent to S. And the way I do S prime is I could do one of the th following three things. So I can either do a translation, which means that my X prime coordinates are just my X coordinates plus some constant A. And A is a constant, of course. Okay. This just shifts my position. It shifts my origin, which will subsequently shift all my positions. Okay, Still the same exact inertial frame. Still a valid inertial frame. It's not the same exact one, sorry. But it's still perfectly valid. What else can I do? I can do a rotation, which would be x prime equals some rotation matrix R times x. And this could be a rotation about the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, or a combination of axes. Because who's to tell me that if I tilt my head 30 degrees, I won't see the same physics as you. It's still an inertial frame, right? And these R matrices are actually special because they're rotation matrices. And in fact, we'll show later when we do a little bit about group theory that rotation matrices obey this following rule, that the transpose times the regular matrix is the identity. That's just a little thing about um, rotation matrices. And then lastly, we still have an inertial frame if we give what's called a boost. So this is called a boost. And a boost essentially is when our x prime position 
position in our prime frame is going to be boosted from our regular position by some velocity vt. Now, the first two are really easy to prove because it's basically common sense, right? But the third one is not so trivial. And let me just prove this real quick for you guys. The way we're going to prove it is because in an inertial frame, of course, acceleration is zero. And acceleration is nothing more than the derivative, second derivative position. And that should be zero, right? So in our inertial frame, this is automatically holding. But in our prime frame, let's just see what happens. So the first derivative x with respect to t, and this is for number three. I just want to prove it real quick. So that's going to be, sorry, x prime is going to be just dx dt. And then the derivative of this guy is just going to be v. Okay. And then let's take the second derivative. So a, in the prime frame, because that's the second derivative, is going to be a in the unprimed frame plus, I'll call this capital A, which is our boost acceleration, okay? And the thing to notice here is that this guy is zero because a boost, by definition, is a constant velocity addition. A boost is constant velocity. This velocity is not changing. So the acceleration, once again, in the primed frame is going to be the same as the acceleration in the unprimed frame and we already know that the acceleration in the unprimed frame is zero. Okay, so that's just a little proof for that. Now, okay, you did these three transformations. Who cares? Inertial frames are not unique. Why, why do I care? Well, well, we'll talk about it a little later, but when things are invariant, invariant means that they don't change, when certain things, in this case the frame, when something doesn't change under some kind of transformation, that means there's something deeper inside it. There's some kind of underlying symmetry, okay? And in this case, these three transformations form a group, and it's actually called the Galilean group. And groups are extremely important in physics, as we'll see later. But for now, just know that groups are basically the structure of things, okay? And... For now, this is all I'll talk about. We've already talked about the principle of relativity. Physics shouldn't depend on what angle you're looking at it from or what frame you're in. Okay? And one more thing to note here is that time. What is time in Newtonian mechanics, right? What is time in general? Time is just, you know, like the arrow of time, that stuff. But... In Newtonian mechanics, time is absolute. So what is time? It's a good question, Josh. Um, so yeah, in Newtonian mechanics, time goes, right? Goes and goes and goes. And it's the same for everyone in their frames. I can have time in my S frame, and I can also have time in my S primed frame. But they still move at, in the same increments. Something else that I can do is that I can start some kind of experiment in my primed frame some kind of time t naught later, right? Let's say I throw a ball up. It's going to have some trajectory, right? And let's say in the unprimed frame I start at this point, and then I see what happens. And in the primed frame I start at this point, and I see what happens. You just translate in time, right? There's no discernible difference. Time is going to be very linear. In Newtonian mechanics and time also is um, is able to be shifted as I just explained it right now but more on that later now one thing to note here is that in cosmology this Gal these Galilean transformations this Galilean group completely breaks down and this has been a was a big problem in physics especially during Einstein's time and that actually led him to actually discover special relativity and then general relativity. And what I mean by the universe breaks Galilean transformations is that think about what happened around like 14 billion years ago. It was the Big Bang. And what happened in the Big Bang? There is no inertial frame at the time of the Big Bang that is stationary. Right? There's no frame with a constant velocity because the universe was expanding so fast that where is like the center of the universe 
where is a frame that's not expanding you know but that's just one area that fails Galilean transformation we'll see later more on how bad Galilean transformations are in the grand scheme of things but for now that's fine okay so one last thing I wanted to talk to you about is One last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is a little more on Newton's second law before we wrap this video up. So again, Newton's second law is F equals MA, obviously. But I'm going to introduce this new term. It's called P. And P is the momentum. Okay. Momentum of the system. And it's defined to be um, the derivative. Well, it's defined to be like this. I kind of did this a bit little bad, but okay. So the Newton's second law is equivalent to saying that the force is the time derivative of momentum, which means that momentum is nothing more than mass times velocity. Okay, momentum is the mass times the velocity. It's the momentum of our system, and Newton's second law, when translated, is F equals dP dt. Okay. And I think that's all for now. And then next, in the next uh, video, we'll talk about more on forces. We'll talk about other stuff. And we're just going to keep expanding, 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 building all this knowledge. Okay, so I will see you there.